Well, good morning. Notice the worship team got most of the targets out of reach, so I shouldn't be flailing and knocking over too much, but we'll see what happens by the end. I can move too, you know. We're glad uh, to have you with us this morning, those of you who are regulars, those of you who are irregulars, uh, guests. We're glad to have you with us, especially uh, those of you online. We stream all over the world, and we get hits from Japan and England and uh, all sorts of places, so we're glad to have you uh, joining us as well. My wife is watching right now, so everyone say, good morning, Cam. Yeah, although it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, she's in Germany for a few weeks, uh, just getting some beauty treatments and shopping and roaming around and getting some culture like she does, and uh, so it's, it's good to... Good to talk to you, honey. She's texting me throughout the service, so we, we are actually communicating. Um, when I spoke with the elders back in December about coming here for a year or so, uh, one of the things they asked me to do, would, would I please preach a series of messages on giving? And uh, apparently it hasn't heard too many messages around here, or it's been a while. I don't know exactly what it was, but uh, that time has come, and I'm glad to do it. Uh, a lot of preachers don't like to preach on giving just I, for a number of reasons. Number, I guess the biggest one is probably they feel like, well, if I get you to give more than I get more because they work for the church, so it's very awkward. They feel like they're asking for a raise, so they don't, they don't like to go there. But that really is kind of stupid. It's, it's a, we need to preach on it, and you need to hear it, and the church needs us to hear it. And so I have no hesitation to preach on it, and uh, I'm going to preach this week and next week. And in two weeks, we've got Teen Challenge coming, so that Sunday will be a wash as far as the giving series goes. And then the next Sunday is Father's Day, and so I figure I probably ought to do something for Mother's Day since I had James Nicholson come and preach on money on Mother's Day, and that was all me. So if that was inappropriate, I apologize, but uh, I wasn't here, so I didn't really care. I did speak to James last week, and we had quite a good chuckle over it. His mother gave him a hard time. She was with him. Like, you should be preaching on mothers. Don't listen to Doer. That's okay. Don't listen to Doer. That's wise advice. Um, Randy Alcorn has written a book called uh, Money, Possessions, and Eternity, and so this series is Cash, Stuff, and Forever. I wanted to be a little bit original there, but it's one of the best books on the whole subject. And so I'm drawing a lot from Randy Alcorn, throw my own stuff in there, um, but we're going to do this after Father's Day for probably a few more weeks because it's not all just about money and stuff. It's a lot of it, what the subject we're talking about has to do with trust. It goes way beyond money. And so we're going to flesh that out uh, with a number of uh, examples from the scriptures over the next couple of weeks. Uh, but people really want to know. I believe that people really want to know what does the Bible say about this very important area of their life. Churches that deal with the subject see greater giving results. For instance, George Barna uh, did a study, and he concluded that churches in which pastors preach a series of messages about giving are nearly two and a half times more likely to experience an increase in giving than when preachers speak about giving one sermon at a time or two or more non-consecutive occasions during the year. In other words, people want to hear about this, and when they hear about it, they can act on it, and when they act on it, they're blessed, and the churches are blessed, and if the churches are blessed, then we're able to be a blessing to other people, and so churches should not be afraid to talk on this, and I'm not afraid to talk on this, as you're going to figure out here very shortly. A.W. Tozer wrote that the man of pseudo-faith, that's false faith, will fight for his verbal creed but refuse flatly to get into a predicament where his future must depend upon that creed being true. In other words, the guy that doesn't have a real faith, he'll say that he does, and he'll defend what he says he believes, but he's going to make sure he stays safe. He says he always provides himself with secondary ways of escape so he'll have a way out if the roof caves in. And then he says this, what we need very badly these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God as completely now as they know they must do at the last day. That's easier said than done. I understand that. And the message series that we're embarking on now is encroaching on enemy territory. Some of you already have your backs up. You've already got the defenses going, and you're determined that you're not going to hear another word that I said. 
the enemy wants to uh, infiltrate right at this point. So I would ask that you bathe it in prayer, bathe the church in prayer, because how you use your cash, how you use your money, how you use your stuff is a decisive statement of your eternal values. Your life is like a bow drawn across a string of a cosmic violin. And your life is going to resound for eternity with vibrations that include decisions, especially decisions you make about what to do with your money and your stuff. You have the ability to touch eternity with your life. Did you know that? And with what you do with your stuff, you can touch eternity. You can make a difference. Many believers have succumbed to the heresy that the life they live now can be lived disobediently without serious effects on their eternal state. And we conveniently ignore the many passages in the scripture that speak of the necessity of obedience and of followership. And God is not impressed with just saying that we believe because even the, even the devil believes. God is impressed when our walk matches our talk. So we're going to talk about that this morning. Randy Alcorn says there's something in his book to offend everyone, and I have to admit there's something in this series of messages to offend everyone. If you're offended at some point, God bless you. That's probably a good thing because it means he's doing something inside of you. I'm offended at some points. I don't even like everything I preach. And that's okay. Scripture has an annoying tendency to take issue with the way that we prefer to think and live, doesn't it? That's probably why so many people neglect their Bible or they choose to go to churches that dilute or soften the Bible's teaching in many areas, not just money. So I want to give you permission. Talk to me, complain to me, yell at me, ask me questions, encourage me, email me, whatever it takes to communicate with me as we go through this. Maybe you've got questions that has never been satisfied, satisfactorily answered. Communicate with me about this series. Let's interact with it so that we can all grow a little bit better in this whole area. I would love to hear from you. Positive or negative? Let her rip. Richard Halverson was the former U.S. Senate chaplain years ago, and he wrote these words. He said, Jesus Christ said more about money than about any other single thing, because when it comes to a man's real nature, money is of first importance. He said, money is an exact index to a man's true character. And all through scripture, he says, there's an intimate correlation between the development of a man's character and how he handles his money. An intimate correlation between who you are spiritually and what you do with your stuff, including your money. Now, I think if the Bible were written today uh, and it would be judged by what it says about money and possessions, it would probably never be published. If it were published, it would probably never get a second printing because it's redundant, it's extreme, it's shocking, and and sin of all sins, it it tends to induce guilt. We go to the Bible for comfort, don't we? We don't go to the Bible for financial advice. We don't go for financial advice. For that, we go to... James Nicholson. We go to Wall Street. We go to uh, the Money Magazine or Forbes or your uncle. But the Bible, the Bible's spiritual. The Bible, the Bible's all about grace and love and brotherhood, isn't it? Did you know that there's twice as many verses on money than on faith and prayer combined in the Bible? Twice as many. Did you know that Jesus talked more about money than heaven and hell? Did he have it wrong? It's in there. It's everywhere in there. We're going to see a little bit about that this morning. The sheer amount of Bible teaching on money screams for our attention. Jesus devoted 15% of his words to the subject. For example, Luke chapter 19. You remember the story about Zacchaeus, tax collector guy, climbed the tree. Jesus comes. They have an encounter. And after that, Zacchaeus announces he was going to give half of his possessions to the poor. And he'd pay back fourfold anybody that he'd wronged. Remember that story? Remember what Jesus said? Today, 
salvation has come to this house. Jesus judges the salvation of Zacchaeus not because Zacchaeus said a prayer, not because Zacchaeus got baptized, not because Zacchaeus did something holy or, or religiously ritualistic. He judged the salvation of, of Zacchaeus because of his cheerful eagerness. He wasn't even just willing to give his money away. He wanted to give it away. Something was transformed inside Zacchaeus. They'd never seen this before. All his life, he'd been a taker. And now all of a sudden, who can I give it to? Who can I give it to? That's how you measure your faith. Not by sitting here looking real pretty. What's going on on the inside? Where you live and where no one else can see. Where you desire. Zacchaeus' desire has changed. And Jesus says, yeah, he gets it. Today salvation has come to this house. Another 19 chapter, Matthew chapter 19. It's interesting. We're going to hit a couple 19s today. I didn't notice that until uh, just driving in here. So pay attention to it. There'll be another one. Matthew 19, you got this rich young ruler guy comes up to Jesus and he wants to know how to get eternal life. It's a great question. He's a very devout guy. He's Jewish. Jesus says, you know, keep the commandments. And the guy says, I've done that. I've done, I've done them all. He's, he's very proud of, of his religion. He's very well credentialed spiritually. He's probably got a seminary degree. He can speak and write Hebrew, but that's no big deal back then because they were Hebrew. Then Jesus gives a very interesting answer in verse 21. It's not an answer I'd ever give. You'd fire me. And you certainly never go to church here. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions. Give them to the poor. And then come and follow me. What the heck kind of answer is that? That's insane. I want to know how to get to heaven. It's the most important question a human being can ask. You're talking to the one guy in the history of the world that can absolutely answer it with complete assurance. And he says, empty out your bank account. And the guy says, Is there like a part B? That's a different answer than most of us would have given, isn't it? If it me, I'd I'd, 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 I'd say, hey, that's a great question. And I commend you for asking that. Clearly, you have a deep interest in spiritual things. I'd want to pump the guy up because he's a good giver. I don't want him giving this stuff away to the poor. I want him giving it to me so that we can get some chairs in here and get a new sound system and a new building and and hire more staff. I don't want to give it away. I want it. And you want it too. Especially if you're in church leadership. Or I would have said, I would have said, hey, you know, you need to believe in me and and you need to tell God that you're sorry for all the areas you messed up. And, And I'd take him to the river and I'd have John the Baptist baptize him. And then we'd just be thrilled that we've got a, a wealthy follower in our midst now. And we'd make him the chairman of the board and we'd give him celebrity status because he's got a lot of money. He's got a lot of power. Amen. And some churches court those people. And sometimes maybe we do too. We just don't be as upfront about it. But sell your possessions? Give to the poor? No, 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 no. That's not what we're going to ever say here. Amen? Amen. Thank you for being honest tonight. Jesus' answer cost him a valuable convert. The next few verses. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had great wealth. 
And Jesus said, no, 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 you misunderstood me. Come back, come back, come back. You only have to sell 10% of your possessions. I'd rather have a little bit of you than none of you. Is that what it says there? No. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, for he had great wealth, and Jesus let him walk away. Because he has a mission for the church, and it cannot be fulfilled by half-hearted people, ever. And his disciples are incredulous, and Jesus says to them, I'm telling you guys the truth, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, you think? And asked, who then can be saved? Even his disciples failed to understand the barrier that wealth presents to genuine spiritual birth and growth and quite frankly often so do we jesus didn't say what most of us would have suggested just give 10 percent of it to the poor he was probably already doing that anyway he didn't say set up a trust fund keep the principal intact and give away the interest which is what some of us would have done and i just want to press the pause button here and say that his response is not necessarily to all of us, but he knew that this guy's God was his money. But to you and me, he might say that or he might say something else. It depends where are you putting your trust. That's what God's going to put his finger on in your life. For some of you, it's money and you need to hear this. And you need to downsize and simplify for the sake of the kingdom of God and for the sake of your own heart, which God wants to trust him with everything. But it might be something else. It might be a relationship. It might be a career. It might be status. It might be a house. It might be a car. It might be how you look to other people. Take your pick. It could be any number of things. Jesus knew that none of us can enthrone God unless in the process we knock the false gods off the throne. He gauged Zacchaeus' true spiritual condition by his willingness to part with his money, and he gauged this young ruler's true spiritual condition by his unwillingness to part with his money. And the sad thing is, we don't know what happened to the guy. Just not told. I'd love to think that when the church got started, that he was among the 3,000 maybe that were baptized in the day of Pentecost. Maybe he shadowed Jesus for a few years and finally made the decision. I understand. Sometimes it takes us a while to arrive at the place where we're just discontented enough to let it go. I get that. The Bible calls that transformation. It calls it sanctification. It's the process by which we begin to identify our idols and let them go. And and some people do that early on. Zacchaeus, instantaneous. This guy took a while if he ever actually did it. I get that. You get that. Now here's here's a timeless principle here. Why is money so important to God? Because there's a powerful relationship between your true spiritual condition and your attitude and actions concerning money and possessions. powerful relationship between who you really are spiritually and your stuff you can't deny it well you can but you're lying to yourself if you do some more biblical examples in luke chapter 3 this is very interesting john the baptist is baptizing obviously thus the name and and he tells the crowd he he says to them prove by the way you live that you've really turned from your sins and turn to god see there's there's a there's there's something we turn away from and there's someone that we turn to that's all throughout the bible john the baptist is just following in the footsteps of the great prophets here and so they asked him the question. He's got all these different groups who are, who are listening to him preach and watching him baptize and submitting to him. And so they say, well, give us some examples. What's that look like? Which you deserve to have. You should always ask 
whoever's preaching or teaching the word of God. What does that look like in my life? Because you really want to know. And I want to know. So John the Baptist gets very, very practical with him. But how spiritual is it? He tells the people, share your food and clothing with the poor. Doesn't tell them to get in a small group. Doesn't tell them to go to temple. Share your stuff. The tax collectors were watching him. Maybe some of Zacchaeus' friends. Maybe this is where Zacchaeus was first introduced to Jesus. We don't know. He says, be honest with the money you take from people. Nothing wrong with making money. You got to have it. That's how you take care of your family. That's how, you, that's how you're generous for the poor. Just do it honestly. Just do it with integrity. Do it with a clean conscience so that others can speak well of you. Nothing wrong with money at all. Just be honest with it. And he tells the Roman soldiers, interesting, they're watching too. They're stuck there. Nobody wants to be a Roman soldier in Palestine. The Jews hated the Romans. So they're probably from somewhere else. They're from away. But they're, they're asking Jesus, well, or asking John the Baptist, well, how, what's this look like, this living for God thing? Because this was new to them. Their gods didn't demand anything moral at all. Their gods just had to be appeased, and their gods were as foul and corrupt as anyone else. But now these Roman guards are here, and they're listening to a prophet who's telling them about a new God and, and a Messiah that's going to come on the scene, and they have spiritual interest. And so they're asking questions. Boy, push the pause button on that. You've got people in your life that, for all that you can tell, should have no interest in spiritual things because of their background, but they are interested. Show them something. Give them something. The Roman soldiers, John the Baptist tells them, don't extort money. Be content with your paychecks. That's our, our, we're going to preaching now. We can just go home. We all love to complain about our pay. It's what we do at our jobs. That's why HR department says, now don't let anyone know what you're making. <laughs> everybody knows what everybody else is making. And when you find out that this person who doesn't work near as hard as you is making more than you, all of a sudden you're discontented. Jesus, I mean, the Bible is so freaking relevant. It tells these soldiers, be content with your paychecks. The interesting thing is, no one had asked John the Baptist, how do I handle my money? Did you catch that? The question they asked was, how do we prove that our lives have been supernaturally transformed by God? What's that look like? And John didn't know how to talk about spirituality without talking about how to handle your money and your possessions. Acts 19. There's the other 19. Paul's preaching in Ephesus. Wins a bunch of people who make their living in the occult. Talking to the dead. Consulting the stars. Poking around inside animal entrails. Trying to divine the future. Just like you can do here on Prince Edward Island, you have people who will do all those sorts of things as well. But he preaches the gospel, they convert to Christ, and they demonstrate the reality of their spiritual transformation by their willingness to burn their magic books. And these babies are worth possibly $6 million. It says 50,000 drachmas. You got a little asterisk there in your Bible and it says the drachma is about a day's wage so you take 50,000 times whatever your day's wage is and if you're on Prince Edward Island and you're making minimum wage and I believe that's about $15 an hour maybe it's not quite 15 but it just take $15 an hour you multiply that by the 50,000 and you're sitting there at six million dollars and that's a lot of drachmas that just that just seems kind of extreme doesn't it 
Why not sell them instead and support the apostles' church planting ministry? Why not buy Bibles with it? I know they weren't being printed yet, but they could pay some guy to copy the, what they did have. Or they could build a church building, except they didn't really have church buildings back then. They met in homes, but they could build bigger homes. Or, or they could get a nice multimedia projection system, but burn the books? This is terrible stewardship. But the spiritual truths that they had believed trumped their money. And these baby Christians, that's what gets me when you read this. These are baby Christians just graduated out of idolatry. Gentiles. Romans. These baby Christians understand what's important. And they're willing to give it up. Acts chapter 2, we can, actually, I, I do want to just, this isn't in the, in the slides there, guys, in the sound booth, just bear with me a minute, but I, Acts chapter 2, you're familiar with these? Verse 42, the church has just been started, thousands of people have been baptized, and then we read, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer, and everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, and all the believers were together and had everything in common, and they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, and they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together, and with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Why do you think God added to their number daily people? that were being saved it wasn't just because they were preaching the gospel and telling people they had to do these things it was because their lives were being lived in a way that people wanted to be like that and people were blessed by that you can't just smack people over the head with the bible and say here's the truth and this is what you've got to do and expect them to respond but when they see a community of people living like this sacrificially and loving each other and enjoying each other and and having unity and purpose and direction people want to be a part of that and if the church isn't growing it's because people outside aren't seeing that do you hear me they're not seeing it but when they see it we can't build a big enough building because that's where they want to come. Chapter 4. I'm sorry, I'm going to preaching now. I didn't mean to. <sighs> sorry, honey. She probably disconnected a long time ago. Chapter 4, verse 32, all the believers were one in heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles <laughs> continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and distributed it to anyone so they didn't have any need. No one had to stand up and berate the people and guilt them into doing this. And this series is not going to be a bunch of rules and regulations and thou shouts. Not at all. God loves a cheerful giver, but I hope what this series will do will be encouraging you to say, maybe I just need to hold things a little looser and trust God a little more. It's obvious from just a cursory reading of the New Testament that conversion and filling with the Holy Spirit are supernatural experiences that produces supernatural responses, then and now. So some questions for us. What would John the Baptist likely conclude about your spiritual condition today? Just in your mind, put yourself on the banks and you're saying to him, John, what's it mean for me to live for God? What's he, what's he, just you and John, you have that conversation, okay? What would John the Baptist see in our Christian communities that can only be explained by the supernatural work of God? Most of us, if we're honest, our beliefs about money are not only radically different from God's, but diametrically opposed to them. And, and much of our spiritual progress, much of our spiritual progress is bottlenecked right here. Because this whole money thing is killing us spiritually. I've been at this over 30 years, and there's a lot of truth to that statement. And it's not going to change until you come clean with God in this area of your life. Not only that, but this has special application to those of us who live in unparalleled affluence, which you do. There are no poor people on Prince Edward Island. I really don't believe they exist. 
I just don't. We live in a society where almost everyone enjoys comforts and conveniences that King Solomon never dreamed of. Our poverty level in the West, North America, our poverty level exceeds the average standard of living in most of the rest of the world. We in North America are among the 4% of the wealthiest in the entire world. Jim Walker put this wealth test up a couple years ago. I tried to get some credentials on it, and I couldn't find it, but it rings true to me So, for what it's worth. But he says, if you say yes to any of these, you're in the top 10% of anyone who's ever lived. Do you own more than one pair of shoes? Do you choose what you'll eat today? Do you have your own mode of transportation? Do you have more than one pair of underwear? If you can say yes to any one of those, you're wealthy. For example, assume that you work from age 25 to 65 years and you make $25,000 a year. This doesn't include benefits. This doesn't include retirement. This doesn't include your health plan, plan. This doesn't include pay raises. This doesn't include Canada pension, family inheritance. If you work for 40 years and you only make $25,000 a year, which is not unreasonable for most of us, I don't think, you will have managed a million dollars in your lifetime. And likely very much more, a veritable fortune. So what have you done with your million dollars plus? Romans 14, 12, each of us will give an account of our lives to God. 2 Corinthians 5, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. All of us one day, among other things, are going to have to answer some very tough and uncomfortable questions about our money and our possessions. Questions like, where did it go? And what did I spend it on? And what has been accomplished for eternity through my use of this fortune? Now this hits home. I don't like these questions. And I don't blame you if you don't like them. I like spending money. I like buying stuff. I like nice things. I like hospitality. I want people to have nice things when they come to my house. But I start asking these questions, and my conscience just starts going, did you really need? So I'm talking to myself. There's a powerful relationship between your true spiritual condition and your attitude and your actions concerning your money and possessions. Powerful relationship. That's what I want you to hear this morning. Now, you've got some Monopoly money in your bullet in there, right? Hold that up. Let me make sure everyone's got some Monopoly money. Some of you have 500 and some of you have 100. Those of you who have 100, it doesn't mean you're devalued. It means we ran out of 500s. I want you to gently tear that off, not now necessarily, but at some point. When you go home, would you just put that somewhere where you can see it? It might be in your dresser, it might be in your bathroom, it might be by the toothpaste, it might be in your car and the little thing, you know, between the seats. It might be in your wallet. It might be your, just put that somewhere where you can see it a couple times this week and just ask yourself. God is is what I'm doing with the money you've given me honoring to you? Do you want me to do anything else with it? That's all I'm saying. And your answer may very well be, you're doing a fantastic job. Keep it up. That's great. I'm not here to try to guilt the daylights out of you. I just want you to consider the question. And hopefully that helps you do that. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus, and there might be some of you here, and definitely some who might be watching or listening, and, and you're saying, well, you know, I'm not a follower of Jesus, so what I do with my money doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter, because God, you need to dethrone whatever's on the throne of your life in order, if you're going to come to God. So this does matter to you. And you were made for a higher purpose. If you're not a follower of Jesus, he wants you to be, but you've got to let something go, and it might just be money. So this does matter to you. So as you look at your monopoly money, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you need to ask the question, is there more to life than this?
So I'm, I'm riding into church this morning. And Rob and Mark has been at the Revival in Belfast this week. Some of you, I've seen you there. Others of you have gone incognito. Don't let anyone know you're at that. First one I've been able to get to is their 10-year anniversary. I loved it. Oh, my gosh. I loved it. I, I, I went and I'm like, God, you just need to talk to me. I, I don't feel like I get fed sometimes, and sometimes I feel spiritually like I'm in a desert, and I just want to die spiritually. And I'm like, God, I don't want to go to this meeting because I've heard weird things about it. Raise their hands. I, t- I put a picture up. I didn't draw attention to it. I loved it. I was, I was watching on the first night. These three old white-haired ladies had to be in their 70s or 80s. <laughs> the one was just punching the air. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I've been told all my life that old people don't like to rock it out to Jesus. <laughs> it was loud. <laughs> It was driving, but it was worshiping God. It was unbelievable. Robert Mark is one of the best worship leaders in the world. And it was fantastic. And then I went back Friday night, and, and it was the same thing, those same ladies. Now I just sit up there and I watch them. I don't listen to, I just watch them. I want to be that kind of old person. I want to be, you know, would you turn it up? And they did some of my favorite songs. And so this morning I'm driving in, and I, I, got, I got my album, Belfast and Revival, uh, on my iPod, and I'm, trying, I'm looking for days of Elijah. These are the days of Elijah. Great, we got to sing that next week. Great stuff. I'm looking for it, and, but I, I can only flip through my songs one at a time. On my radio, it connects in, and so I land on when it's all been said and done. And I start listening to it like an idiot. When it's all been said and done, there's just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done, all my treasures will mean nothing. Only what I have done for love's reward will stand the test of time. And then this verse, which is inspired. Lord, your mercy is so great that you look beyond our weakness, that you found pure as gold and miry clay, turning sinners into saints. I will always sing your praise here on earth and in heaven after. For you've joined me at my true home. When it's all been said and done, you're my life when life is done. I'm driving down the number three highway. and I ripped my glasses off. I got tears pouring down. I was wrecked. And I thought, you know, if I got to crash a car and die, this is a heck of a great song to do it to. I needed to be reminded that when it's all said and done, the only thing that matters is what you've done for Jesus Christ and what you've invested in the kingdom of God. Nothing else matters, but we kill ourselves thinking it matters, and it doesn't matter. And that's all I have to say about that. 